16-year-old Ziad Ahmed is a Bangladeshi American Muslim living in Princeton, New Jersey. Shortly after the September 11, 2001 terror attacks in the U.S., he saw firsthand the misconceptions and prejudice people had about Islam. Ziad saw a need to speak out, to have a voice, not just for himself, but for others who felt alone in defending who they are and where they come from. Two years ago, he started a website called Redify. It's an online place for young people to share their stories in order to help others defy stereotypes and embrace acceptance. His work is so renowned, he was recognized by the White House. In fact, his efforts earned him a seat at President Barack Obama's dinner table this past summer. He's here to share more about his journey. Pretty incredible journey, <laughs> I might say, too. Welcome Thank to Full you. Frame. Thank you for having me. So tell me about starting this. What, what was the deciding factor that you felt like you had to do something? So I don't think there's any one moment or thing that made me, that prompted me to start Redefy, but it was my entire life experiences coming together, realizing that I had to be part of starting and, and initiating a positive change in this world that really prompted me to start Redefy. So the summer before my freshman year um, in 2013, I said to myself, look, there's this community need. I see so many of my friends, so many people in this world being ostracized, excluded, marginalized because of who they are, where they come from, and people are just defenseless. And, and I've never had a problem speaking up for myself and defending my faith and my ethnicity and my attributes, but there are so many people who don't have that same confidence. So I thought to myself, how can I better this situation? What can I do to make this better? So I went about creating Redefy because even by myself, like, there were so many misconceptions that I held, and even, even as I go through this journey, I learned so much more about the diversity that exists in our world. Um, and I wanted to create a platform by which teenagers could really re become educated about these issues and engaged in them. So I started this website and reached out to some of my friends to really start this movement, and, and I've been very fortunate to see it blossom from there. Okay, but you're a teenager. Most teenagers are thinking about going out on a date or perhaps getting a better locker. So, I mean, was this a hard sell with other teenagers? Like, man, man what do we want to get all involved in this? Or, or did you find that the, you had a receptive audience? I mean, I'm fortunate to live in Princeton, New Jersey and be surrounded by an incredible group of young people and adults, obviously, at Princeton University that are really engaged in issues that are most pertinent to our society. So in that way, I definitely had friends and people who are supporting me from the, from the get-go. However, my, my, biggest obstacle can, my biggest obstacle in my work continues to be trying to convince teenagers that we can have efficacy despite our age. And, and one message that I want every person who hears me speak to, to really fully understand and comprehend is that our age does not limit our activism. And that our voices, despite all else, can be heard. And, and, and if anything, they're heard more because of our age, because we're more vulnerable, because we're more innocent, because we know what's happening now. It's real, these issues affect us. And I think that as I do things like go on CCTV and I, and I increase my visibility and I use my voice to advocate for justice, people are listening. And more and more teenagers are willing to be involved because they see firsthand with me as an example that, hey, you know what? Teenagers can make a difference, they are making a difference, and we want to be part of this. September 11th, a terrible tragedy here in the United States, and yet uh, we saw so many good things come of it where people lined up to give blood, and, and that, that, that was early on. But then we saw the ugly side of it, uh, which obviously got you interested in doing what you're doing. What happened after that terrorist attack that you started to see in terms of discrimination or just prejudice, people saying things or doing things that really kind of galvanized your interest in doing what you're doing today? I mean, I, I, I want to make clear, first of all, that I'm not just inspired to do this work because of anti-Muslim bigotry. Bigotry of all forms, like, deeply, deeply, deeply hurts my heart every time I see it. There are just so many people being discriminated against in this world for things that they can't control. And, and that is why I do this work, not just because of anti-Muslim bigotry, but certainly after 9-11 and in a world where anti-Muslim anti bigotry is so rampant and so normalized, it's a huge issue and I deal with it every single day of my life. 
whether it be after an article is written about me and in the comments they're just disgusting things saying about how I'm just going to go back to ISIS the next day and how my work it doesn't have validity because of my faith and that it's a front for anti-Semitism and just gross things because people aren't even willing to click on the links. They just see the words Muslim and categorize that with gross thoughts because of the way the media has misconstrued my faith is something that I deal with every day and something that I am working towards to defeat because we cannot continue to paint a, a people with one brush, whether it be Muslims, whether it be the LGBTQ plus community, whether it be any community. We are more than the labels that society gives us and I will keep saying it and until the day I die. What about social engagement, social justice engagement with teenagers? Um, you, I, I was looking at your website. You get a lot of uh, people involved in this from your school and elsewhere, uh, uh, around the world, in fact. Um, talk to me about the ripple effects. Once you start to create this, when did you start to see other teens say, hey, th this connects with me and, and, and identifying with what you were after? So I think that originally it was just me and four of my friends, but then I really saw a lot of people being interested in the work and being like, Ziad, how can I help? How can I get involved in cr promoting acceptance, in promoting diversity? And so we created the school representatives team. And after we did that, we saw people all over the world, a lot of my friends that I've made through summer programs and things of that sort, reaching out and being like, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this movement. I want to be part of the solution. And since then, and since we've had more of a media presence, and as we grow in visibility, now we get applications for our team from all over the world, from people who have just heard about us through the internet, or people who just see one of our tweets that's been retweeted, or things like that. And I think social media and the internet has been instrumental in allowing us to amplify our message. Because what we can do is we can say, we, we publish quality content. We allow for anyone to publish stories. We, we, publish on, we, we post on social media. We do all these things that can reach are really a huge audience. We have almost 2,000 likes on Facebook, over 30,000 hits on our website, and we're growing every single day. And that allows us to engage people from all over the world and really target to the youth, because that's who we're trying to engage. So if, if somebody's never gone to your website, what kind of stories are they going to read? What, what are some of the things that they're going to see there? Well, we hope to be a place where on our website you can see the whole gamut of diversity that exists. And we're trying to get there as we Ha grow a more diverse and more complete team and a more international team. But you'll see stories of people trying to, rec uh, trying to reconcile where they live with their school and how people and their perception of people's faith and stories of people saying, why do you wear that hijab? What does that mean? You're a terrorist. People saying you don't belong here. People saying you're, not, you're smart for a black kid or you don't belong in honors classes because of your race. Just in really moving stories, really raw, intimate, stories of teenagers, youth, dealing with these issues and having to deal with things that are just completely unfair. People just saying these uneducated, misinformed, ignorant statements, not necessarily out of malice, but just out of severe mis miseducation. We have a lack of education in, in, in this country and in this world about minorities, about hearing narratives that are different from our own. And what Redefy hopes to be is a platform by which we can educate ourselves about narratives that we would otherwise be unfamiliar with, uneducated about. And that where I think, that's where I think the power lies. Let me ask you about here in the United States, because I think this will connect with you. I mean, if, if you're here in the U.S. and you want to watch news and you have a certain bias, uh, it, let's say I, I, I tend to go to the right, I'm going to watch Fox News because it's basically a mirror. Everything that I believe is going to be sent back to me. Perhaps I'm on the left and I watch MSNBC and everything. So how do you, you're obviously going to connect with the people that you want to connect yeah. with who are like-minded. Yeah. How do you move over and yeah. get the people yeah. that really need to get on board and start seeing the world in a absolutely, different way? Absolutely. So. One of the things that I did, because I, I saw that issue from the get-go, is we, so we recently restructured. Um, because before it was what you're saying, you're interested in social justice, come work with us, come see what we have to offer. But now, under our new restructuring, we have a programming team, we have a journalism team, we have an advocacy team, we have all these different teams, so it's like, hey, you're really interested in programming, you can code in C++, come and join our team and be educated through that process. You're really into writing, you like journalism, come join our team and you can be educated through that process. So what we're trying to do is use people's existing interests and have that intersect with our mission and have people become educated and aware about our work in that way and hopefully that prompts them to be part of this larger solution.
I had the great uh, fortune to meet your mom, who's sitting right over there, um, who is just basically on fumes trying to keep up with you. You're going 100 miles an hour. But I get the sense that your parents help shape who you are today. Absolutely, absolutely. How so? I would not be half the person I am without my parents. I think that my upbringing has been the, the key foundation to my activism. My parents from, from, from my birth have, have told me that it's my duty to give back to humanity. They took me to Bangladesh and I saw poverty firsthand. They didn't shut off the news. They allowed me to watch the news. They wanted me to be informed about the state of our reality. And because of that, because of the exposure that they gave me, the, the tools that they empowered me with, I knew that this, that this world has so many injustices and that it was my duty to be part of the solution, that I had to fight for humanity, that I couldn't be complacent in this, in, in this injustice, that as a human being, as part of humanity, it's our responsibility to better it. We can't just sit here and be like, that's somebody else's job. It's our collective responsibility. We look at Syria, we look at the Syrian refugee crisis. It's not Syria's problem. It's not Europe's problem. It's our problem. And my parents inspired that within me because they showed me that we are one people first and that's what we have to rally behind what's most important to all of us is creating a world where a safe where our children can be safe where our children can be accepted but the only way that's possible is if we all rally behind that same idea if we all recognize that all of our children deserve to be safe and accepted they will be because we value each other as human beings because we stand up for what's right and because we stand together as humanity well we will leave it there thanks so much for coming on and thank you so to much us. for having me and that's it for this week. Join the conversation with us on social media. We are CCTV America on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And now you can watch Full Frame on our new mobile app, available worldwide on any smartphone for free. Get the latest news headlines and connect to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Weibo. Search CCTV America on your app store to download today. All of our interviews can still be found online at cctv-america.com. And let us know what you'd like us to take full frame next. Simply email us at fullframe at cctv-america.com. Until then, I'm Mike Walter in New York City. And we'll see you next time.